Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I'm back for day seven here at Worlds 2022. And it was a fun one here today. I think this was the group that a lot of people were waiting for just in terms of results, especially Western fans, because it definitely presented the best opportunity for, I think, any Western team to get out of their group, especially after Fnatic didn't have the most savory of exits in Group A. So today, on Day 7, we're going to be talking about Group C as they finish up the second week of their group. A lot of fun games, a lot of interesting games, certainly a uh, controversial uh, kind of end to the day, but we'll talk about that when we get there. First and foremost, though, of course, down in the comment section, let me know how you guys thought about this day here today, day number seven. What game was your favorite? What game is your least favorite? I think I have a pretty good idea what your favorite game was, because I think it'll probably be shared with a lot of us, but who did you expect to get out of the group? Did you expect the teams that got out to get out? Let me know all of that, of course, down in the comment section Below, it is time, though, to jump into our coverage. We're going to be going over all six games of the day here today. Of course, there could be tiebreakers as well. That's going to be the same through all of these group days, but we're halfway through, and so it's time to jump in now to Group C. And we kicked off Group C with a matchup between one of the top teams and one of the teams that is probably struggling to get out of this group, but can play a little bit of spoiler. You have to remember, no game at the World Championships is pointless. A lot of these games are going to have consequences whether or not we go into them with the expectation that one of the teams could get out. Losing to a team that maybe you shouldn't be losing to at this stage of the tournament could be the difference between getting out of this group and not getting out of this group. And so all the games matter from this point onwards, and we kick it off with a fun one between Rogue and Gam Esports. And definitely a fun way to start the day. You've got two of the more interesting teams in the bracket. Rogue with a very designed, very coordinated style of play that they have pretty much done in every single game so far. Nobody's really tested them in terms of draft and in champion select, uh, trying to get them off of the champions that they've become so proficient on. And that certainly doesn't change in this game as Rogue is able to take game number one of the day, moving themselves up to 4-0 and oh in the group. A very, very favorable spot for this Rogue team to be in. 4 might be the magic number to make it out of this group. It only takes one loss to Gam to make that a reality. But even so, it, 5 is guaranteed out of this group. You cannot miss getting out of groups with 5 wins. And so for Rogue to be sitting here with four already and two more games in the day to go. That's a pretty good place to be in uh, after game number one. And so let's talk about it. Uh, they didn't really get pressured in draft. Like I said, they got a lot of what they wanted. The Jarvan, the Azir, the Lucian, the Nami. All things that I would consider very, very typical to Rogue. Odo is on a tank in the top lane. The Nar wasn't perfect this game. Certainly some mishaps. It's not the Maokai. It's not the Orn. But I don't think he's going to be getting those two for a considerable amount of time. It's probably not the rest of this tournament if I had to guess. But on the other hand, the rest of these picks fall through, and Rogue is very, very happy to snatch them up. Azir not getting banned in Champion Select. It's definitely tough. You have to figure out what three bans to, to throw against Rogue. I actually think they make it incredibly difficult. The Maokai, obviously super big, not only in the meta, but for Odo specifically in that top lane. You've got the Caitlyn. That comp has been playing very successfully throughout the years, just in general. It's always been a pick that I think Rogue plays particularly well, and comp has really stepped into that role. And then the Yumi feels like a must ban on red side as well, and so not a lot of room to put Azir onto that ban list. He slips through. Larson gets to play Ymir. And Rogue really uh, capitalizes on that. Azir can be super strong in lane, but he's pretty much incredibly dominant by the 20 minute mark. There's really not a lot of mid laners in the game that can even touch him in terms of damage. And so he's a super high prio pick. Really like picking him up first. Uh, Gam answers a little bit weirdly with the set and the Kalista. I do like the Kalista pick, generally speaking, but it leaves up the Lucianami. And honestly, Comp and Trimby, you cannot give them Lucianami. It's not something that I think should be available to them. I'm not sure if Sile and BA still play the Lucianami or if they practiced it all too much, but that clearly should have been the pick here. Put Rogue on the Kalista. I understand they're also very good at that, but Lucianami for them is an S-tier pick. You get Maoring on his signature Jarvan. Odo on a tank in the top lane. It's everything they could have possibly wanted, and they delivered. This was a really, really clean game from Rogue. It wasn't perfect. A lot of their advantages, I think, were because of Gam's draft. In general, Gam had a very early game-focused skirmish-heavy draft, and while I do recommend teams that believe they're worse uh, to draft something like this, try to find picks in the early game, try to generate their own gold lead, it unfortunately just wasn't going to work out for Gam in this case. You really needed Levy to step up on this Graves. He was the essential part of this comp working in general, and Style and BA really needed to win bot lane, but going into Lucianami, the Kalista set, while it can win, it's certainly not an unwinnable lane. It's not something that I would expect to dominate in the same way that it would kind of need to in order for something like that to like work in the way that it needs to. And if the Graves is 
isn't going to be working early game and isn't going to be creating place, it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to find avenues for you to generate a large enough gold lead where you're not just going to eventually get outscaled by this Azir, right? Like, it's going to be very difficult to face him in late game team fights. Luckily for Gam, they were trying to make plays early. And again, luckily for Gam, Rogue was actually attempting to match a lot of those plays. This is a scale heavy comp on the side of Rogue with some early options. I like the Jarvan for early game. It can create a lot of pressure pretty much in any lane he chooses because the EQ combo, if it lands, is pretty much is pretty much death for anybody on the team. Nobody has the mobility to really survive that. Maybe the Galio, but you know, it depends on the lane state, right? If you're ganking the Galio, likely it's already in a position where he's going to be pretty easy to kill. And so there really are a lot of good opportunities for the Jarvan in this game. And you have a really strong bot side here with the Lucian Nami. This is the strategy that Rogue has implemented throughout the entire year. I always talked about this in the LEC reviews. If Malrang is able to generate that early lead and is able to take control of the map in a more cohesive way than maybe he was in some of their worst games, it's over. Like, Malrang from ahead is a completely different jungler than Malrang from behind, and I think that shows here, while he wasn't super far ahead in this game, he still was able to create a lot of plays, able to keep the tempo going. And they also love to play through bot side early. Comp and Trimby have really been the early game focus of Rogue that's been heavily talked about on the desk, and I heavily, heavily agree with that. I think when Rogue's bot lane is on an early game, push-focused, uh, skirmish-oriented, like, duo, I think that is always going to be in the favor of Rogue. They are very, very good at that style of play. Maorang has a propensity to want to be bot side pretty much all the time, trying to protect that bot lane, and Larson and Odo are definitely secure enough in their solo lanes to allow, allow a lot of pressure elsewhere, and so... For Rogue, really like this draft, and I think they executed on it well. Comp and Trimby were able to generate their lead in the bottom lane, like we expected. Silent BA, while I do think they're good players, are just not on the level of Comp and Trimby. And then by the time we hit the late game, this Azir is really able to take over a lot of these team fights. The Nami ended up becoming incredibly important for a lot of these heals to make some of these trades really, really even, especially in the mid game when Gam is supposed to be taking over. And then by the time, you know, we hit those power spikes on the side of Rogue where Nar is going to be a big boy, Malrang does have a lot of shred in him, and you've got Nazir and Lucian as your duo with Nami me kind of healing and you know, d buffing damage through that. I mean, it's, it's just a ludicrously good comp that I think they execute on well. I know a lot of people are going to say they don't like how aggressive Rogue played in the early game, but honestly, I didn't mind it really all that much. With Illusion, Nami in the bot lane, I do like the fact that they wanted to try and push their advantage that they had. I think they maybe overextended a tad bit and gave a little bit too much to this Graves, made the game a little bit more interesting than it needed to be, but that's more the, the it just needs to clean up the plays rather than it being a mistake of the plays that you were making, if that makes sense. I like the idea, while the execution wasn't perfect, it was good good enough to get you to the point of the game where you could win it. So player of the game, pretty easy call here. It's going to be comp on the Lucian. Really, really solid game in laning phase. Not a lot of complaints from him. He is really, really, really consistent. It's actually insane to remember that he did not have a team last year, that he was dropped from 10th place Vitality for Crown Shot. Now he's on here on the world stage, probably being one of the more consistent AD carry players in the entire tournament. It's just a big, big credit to not only Rogue Scouting System for being able to realize like, oh, Comp has a lot more than what he's shown at a professional level, but also Comp to be able to not give up once he got benched from a 10th place team. He kept working, he proved it to Rogue clearly, and then he proved it to the entire world when he came back and really dominated in both spring and summer where he was great. He's great again in this game. The Lucianami has been super consistent for Rogue. I would expect them to go back to that a lot. Trimby is one of the best Enchanter players in the world, genuinely. I was a little bit worried going into this tournament when I kind of figured there were going to be a little bit more engagers, but Trimby just going back to a lot of these Enchanter picks that have been so consistent for Rogue throughout the year. We've seen the Soraka, the Nami's obviously huge. We're, you know, we're, we're seeing Lulu kind of rise back into presence here. So a lot of good picks for Rogue. And it's not like Trimby can't play the engager. He is, he is still really, really, really good on picks like Alistair and Rakan and whatever, right? You know, he, those are still signature picks of his. I just think the Enchanter play style fits him so well with that early game poke mentality. And especially him and Comp, this Lucian Nami lane is essentially perfect. Malrang, while not perfect in the early game, was good enough to be able to get them to the lake game. Certainly some mistakes, but definitely could have been worse. Uh, that's definitely what I'll say about Maorang. Odo also made a lot of mistakes in this game. I I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to say it a little bit. Odo's got a little bit of a small champion pool. While he has a lot of champions that I think he can play at a good enough level, I'm not sure he has a large champion pool at a world's level, like a truly top class level. Not to say he's a bad player, but Odo is obviously the best weak side top laner that we've had in the LEC in a very long time. That's kind of been his role, and that continues to be the role on this team with Comp and Trimby being such a strong side bot lane. 
So Odo on these tanks, very, very good, but the Gnar certainly didn't look the same way that something like the Maokai or the Orn did in the first couple of games of this group stage. Something to note there for later in the day. And then Larson on Azir, once he got to that point, he was going to be fine. He doesn't make mistakes in the early game, and he's really good in team fights. This Azir pick is basically perfect for Larson. He's always going to be the control mage player rather than the playmaker, and Azir just fits his timing and his mentality basically perfectly. For Gam, on the other hand... Decent game, I would say, overall. Y you had opportunities here. I thought Levy actually played this game pretty well, was able to create advantages on the Graves, just wasn't able to actually do a ton on them. You index probably a little bit too heavily into early game here. You've got the top side in Renekton, the bot side in the Callista set that ends up just getting counterpicked with the Lucian Nami. I know Callista can win that. It's not a uh, true counterpick, but... The better bot lane's probably going to win that, and unfortunately, that's just not going to be style in BA. And then I really hate the Galio pick in the mid lane. I don't really think it accomplishes much. You really want to funnel your jungler in this comp in general, because Graves is really going to be the only way that you're winning these late game team fights. Unfortunately, Kati had absolutely no effect on this game. He was down like 60 CS on the Azir because he kept roaming, and they weren't really getting getting anything out of it. Kiaya was met in the top lane. He was Renekton. He was able to pressure early and was able to create some openings for Levy to come and capitalize on, but for the most part, it was Odo making mistakes, in my opinion, rather than Kiaya really stepping up. And then, like I already talked about, Style and BA really kind of got run over in the bot lane. Style's going to be my dead of the game here. The Callista pick was just a little bit too aggressive for me. I understand that you want to be able to dominate this lane early, but there's way too many picks still on the table by the time you take Callista in the first rotation of red side for you to feel confident at all in your ability to play that into comp and trimby, and I just don't think it worked out. BA wasn't much better, but he was okay on some of these set engages. That's actually kind of difficult to take down, but for the most part, Lucian and Azir just did so much damage by the late game. It did not really matter. Where are both teams now? Well, Gam sitting in a really bad spot, sitting at 0-4. They're going to be lucky to get a win out of this group. Uh, they only have top esports and DRX left to play. Neither team that, like, they should ever be able to beat. And so, uh, it's definitely going to be a miracle run on the side of Gam from this point. They're not eliminated, but they're theoretically eliminated from group stage at this point. There's really just not a lot that they can do. And then for Rogue, you're in a really good spot. Like I said, getting that fourth win, very, very important. Four wins is usually enough to get you into group stage, but... It doesn't quite lock them in yet. There is potential for a three-way tie at the end of the day if, you know, Top Esports can go 3-0 and and if DRX can go 2-1 and with their only loss being to Top Esports, then you're actually in, a, in an interesting spot with a three-way tie. So Rogue technically could still not make it out of this group, but sitting at 4-0, you've got to feel incredibly excited for really the only Western team to really show up at this tournament so far. Moving on to game number two of day number seven now, and I'm going to preface this uh, pretty, pretty extensively here because this is probably the game of the year. This was my most favorite game of the year to watch, and trust me, I think I've watched a lot of League of Legends this year. Not only did I watch all four of the major regions, both spring and summer, every international event, I watched the playoffs of all the minor regions. I've watched basically every bit of League of Legends content that has been put out at a major level this year, and this was my number one game so far. I think a lot of people are going to agree with that. So before I jump into it, for all those people who don't watch the games and just hear me talk about them and you want to know what games are worth watching, this game is worth watching. I don't want to spoil who ends up winning it, but it is worth watching. Game number two here on day number seven, and it is a matchup between GAM Esports and Top Esports. A super, super, super big difference in the dichotomies of these two teams. The number two team from the best region in the world, and, a, and the number one team from a region that's kind of below even NA. Uh, if you really want to think about it in that respect, this should have been a no-brainer. But you know what? Dreams really do come true, and some stars just come crashing down on the biggest stage. And that's what happened to Top Esports here today, as GAM picks up their first win of the tournament over Top Esports. A miraculous and phenomenal win from an incredibly scrappy GAM Esports team. They go for a really interesting comp. They draft set on B1. Certainly think that was an insane pick. It's not like anybody was going to really contest them. For that pick, Top Esports plays almost no set. Even Wayward in the top lane doesn't play it. At first, we think it's going to be BA playing it because he just played it in the previous game with the Callista, who they do end up picking before the second round of bans. But he ends up getting flexed to the mid lane because they go for Renata on B5 and they draft the Karthus. Now, this is something that Levy has been incredibly famous for throughout his entire career. I would say the Nocturne and the Karthus are the two picks that Gam has most been willing to pull out in big situations, I'll say. And boy, howdy, did it look interesting in this game. I'm not usually a big fan 
of these power farm junglers, but you're actually going into another one, relatively speaking. The Graves isn't exactly someone who's going to be lighting the world on fire in the early games when it comes to his gank pressure. And so you're actually in a pretty decent spot for Karthus to just be able to get to that power spike. First, of course, at level 6, so he can start farming the first strike gold. And then second, of course, at level 11, where he starts being able to absolutely decimate enemy teams in team fights, even if he is able to go down. Once you get to that point in the game, the Karthus is really scary. The Orn's going to have a ton of items, not only for himself to be an incredible frontline tank, for this pretty decent midline of Gam, but also for the rest of the team, causing, you know, champions like Karthus and Kalista to do even more damage than they normally would be able to do towards the back half. And you've actually got really good engage on this team from the set on potential flanking opportunities and then potential redirection when it comes to the Renata as well. So if you can hit that late game, you're actually in a decent spot to be able to team fight here. But top esports, on the other hand, are no slabs either in this regard. They have the Lucianami in the bot lane. They've got the Renekton in the top lane. So early pressure is there. And for a team like top, who's very, very dominant when it comes to their laning phase, or at least they have been over the course of the LPL split, that's usually a pretty good thing. Not to mention you've got Knight on what is, in my opinion, his best champion. Maybe Silas obviously is up there too, but Ari definitely feels like one of his signature champions, and he gets that here in the mid lane. We're seeing very little Ari, but Top Esports has certainly not been afraid to pull it out in this tournament when they feel like it benefits them, and the roam ability, the playmaking ability of Ari in this lane, the consistency with which he's going to be able to shove out that lane in mid lane and be able to make plays on the map is huge. Top Esports should have a ton of pressure in the early game, even with the lack of an early game focused jungler here in the Graves, and so... You're sitting here and you're going, okay, Top should be able to control this game early on and should just snowball it out of control, but we're hitting this point where while Top Esports is ahead in gold, Gam is still able to be relatively even in these fights. We're seeing a lot of two for twos. We're seeing a lot of three for threes in these big five for five team fights. And honestly, a lot of these dragons end up going Gam's way. It's very, very interesting. They're able to get soul in this game which is absolutely ginormous for their chances of being able to win this. But obviously, it does not stop there. While they do have the scaling comp, you, you're going into top esports. You're going to need to really play a lot of the back half of these team fights well. Knight was actually playing really, really well in this game. He was able to find a ton of gold throughout the map, and he was doing a really good job to try and make plays to keep top esports in it. And even Jackie Love and Mark were doing relatively okay on the Lucianami, but the top side was becoming increasingly a problem for top as the Renekton really started to do nothing towards the back half of this game. And the Graves was never really hitting that power spike that he was supposed to hit to become the central carry for them in these late game team fights. And so Gam was really starting to exert some pressure, but there still was a gold deficit that is, of course, until Gam loses the Elder Dragon. You're like, oh, that must be the end of the game, right? Tion's able to get the Elder Dragon Steel. They're able to do a ton of damage to Gam in the back half of the game. And uh, these team fights are over. You've got nobody left alive. But it's a little bit of a segmented team fight. Uh, some, some players dying a little bit early. Uh, some taking a lot longer to kill. And so, you know, TS is running it down. They've got the Elder. They're able to pick up their final remaining team members in the base. And they start attacking the turrets. And they're on the Nexus. And the members of Gam spawn... And they're able to clean up and ace TES while they're on the Nexus. It's one or two autos away from being destroyed. Gam is able to ace top esports. They're able to march down the mid lane. And they're able to win the freaking game. It is an unbelievable ending. Top Esports is legitimately one or two auto attacks away from just winning it outright. And for Gam to be able to win this, that's phenomenal. I know I've gone super long with the game explanation, but... It was just so jam-packed with fun that it was hard not to get invested in it. Uh, player of the game, pretty easily going to be Levy here on the Karthus. He was really the story of this game. I think you can say that BA was probably the best player individually in this game, but I think Karthus had by far the biggest impact on the game as a whole. Once he got to four items, he was legitimately like one-halfing people's health bars with ultimate after death. He was winning team fights for Gam by himself. Even though he wasn't able to win the Elder and some of those smites weren't exactly perfect, the Karthus was doing so much damage and was the reason they were in a lot of those fights towards the back half of the game that it really couldn't have been anybody else getting player of the game. I thought Kiaya played the tank Orn really well, very much out of his comfort zone. He is the bruiser player on this team. He really doesn't play tanks, or at least he didn't in the BCS. He goes to the Orn in this game and he honestly looks pretty proficient on it. The team overall, I think, looked better with some more frontline-oriented engagers in both Kiaya and Kati. And then, ton of credit to BA. He was genuinely phenomenal on the Renata. Some of these ultimates were spectacular. His ability to consistently catch out Knight on the Ari with the handshake was incredibly instrumental in them being able to win the game at all. But like I said on the side of Top Esports, this top side has really been a problem. We were worried about Wayward going into this tournament, but I certainly didn't think he would perform this bad. 
He's gonna get my dud of the game again here. He goes for the Renekton pick again. This is something he's been very, very persistent on, both over the course of the LPL split and at Worlds so far. And I think it's been really detrimental to him. This is a team that does do really well in the early game, but Wayward doesn't necessarily have the prowess to be dominating lanes on Renekton like he needs to in order to be that late game carry. I'm not saying Renekton's useless in the late game, but I would much rather see other picks in that regard than Renekton. And then... I'm gonna say it, Tian wasn't very good in this game. They were relying a lot on the Graves damage in the back half of these games to be able to win teamfights, and while he was pretty good with the smites, uh, his damage was really lackluster. He was heavily outdamaged by not only the Karthus, but even the Kalista towards the back half of this game, and that's not really acceptable on the side of Graves, especially with the comp that they have around him. They have a ton of ways to be able to initiate him, and he just got bursted out before any of these fights were available. Tian has honestly been very disappointing at world so far, and... In my opinion, a big reason why this team is not sitting at anything be higher than 1-3. and 1-3 and three is disastrous for top esports here, and I can't really blame it on Knight or Mark. Those two players, I think, have been good enough, right? Knight's been the best laner in the, in the World Championships, in the group stage of anybody. Yes, you can criticize him for his ability to translate that lane into anything successful, but at least he's able to generate a gold lead, which I don't think a lot of players here have been able to do. And Mark, I actually think, has played relatively well throughout this tournament. Jackie Love has certainly had his moments, but has had some bad moments as well. I think Wayward and Tiana have been very disappointing, and they're really going to have to step up if TES even wants a shot here at being able to make it out of groups. I will say with this win for Gam, Rogue is now officially locked in the quarterfinals because Top Esports can no longer reach four wins, and so the only other team that can reach four wins is DRX, and there's two spots to get out. So Rogue is confirmed, making it to quarterfinals. The check is going to be cashed with Gam a little bit later, but for Top Esports, this has to feel completely heartbreaking. It now puts you in a really, really awkward position. You have to now go 2-1 and one over the course of the rest of the day and hope that DRX is able to drop a game to Rogue. Uh, if they're not able to do that, you're actually in a really, really bad spot, and it definitely makes things a lot, and I mean a lot more interesting with Group C. Moving on from what is potentially Game of the Year to one that has a ton, and I mean a ton of implications on how the rest of this group is going to pan out. We have a matchup between the two top teams in the group right now coming into game number three. We have a matchup between DRX and Rogue, and both teams certainly drafting some interesting comps. DRX making the fans go crazy by bringing out Ash Heimerdinger in the bottom lane, and Rogue responding in kind by bringing out the Fable. Nasus support. Somewhere, somehow, Ashley Kang is losing her mind, and LS even more so is... I don't know, I don't want to make any sort of inappropriate... Uh, uh, sentence here, but I think you all can 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 kind of guess where, what I'm putting down. But anyways, a, a ridiculous draft from both teams. We even get Odo on the Rumble in the top lane. Everything else relatively standard. Malrang on a signature Jarvan. Larson on a signature Azir. Comp plays a ton of Callista, so a ton of comfort here for Rogue, but even more so for DRX. They're able to get Aatrox on B1. Biyoshi gets Vi, which is a champion he's played a ton over the course of the year. And then Zika gets his Akali. So really a ton of comfort for both teams accentuated by two more interesting picks. Uh, for DRX, it's the Ash and the Heimerdinger. For Rogue, it's the Rumble and the Nasus. And well, I guess DRX's draft was better. I guess we can definitively say Heimerdinger better than Nasus, which is not a sentence I thought I would be saying at Worlds this year. But you know what? Here we are. And we'll get to the Nasus pick. I promise we'll get to it because uh, there's certainly some thoughts on it. But DRX actually played this game really, really well. They dominated basically from the moment one. And uh, just kind of dominated through the entire experience. Really, really impressed with their ability to completely control the pace of this game. I think a lot of that was due to the fact that they had a ton of winning lanes. The Ashheimer Dinger pretty much had perma push over the Callista Nasus. Not really all that surprising considering that Heimer just has so much lane prio and Nasus has literally none. Um, really, the whole idea of Nasus support, which we'll get into later, or at least the idea behind it that I think has been preached is Nasus into Callista. Nasus with Callista into Ash doesn't really do anything, and so not exactly a pick that I'm super thrilled about here, but Deft and Barrel were able to take over a pretty big lead in the bottom lane, and those arrows were clutch. American Sniper Deft in the bot lane there. There's so many cross-map arrows that hit, a lot that were super important in lane. Really, Deft was just super proficient on the Ash overall. It's a pick, obviously, he's played a billion times over the course of the years, but it's really interesting to see him go back to that. I honestly really like Ash in the meta right now. We've been seeing an uptick, I think, in Varus play over the course of the tournament so far, and I actually think Ash is just maybe just a little bit more of a, a an efficient version of Varus. While Varus does a ton of damage in the late game, I think Ash also can do a ton of damage in the late game if you want to go full crit on her, and I think she has more of a variety for the kinds of supports you can play. The Hawkshot's always good. 
good. The arrow's just as useful, if not more so, than the Varus Ultimate, in my opinion, because it's global. And so, a lot of advantages for Ash. I'm really surprised to see Varus get that uptick in priority over her. But Deft kind of pulling that out here and looking really good on it. And then you've got an incredibly strong top side. I mean, you've got Aatrox. There's really not a lot you can do into Aatrox. I, I know Odo tries to go for the counterpick here with the Rumble, but... At the end of the day, Rumble's just simply not strong enough to be able to deal with Aatrox really in any meaningful way, and you've got Vi being able to get on the backline in these team fights. I'm not even bringing up that Zika's on Akali. Like, you already know how this game script goes. We've seen it 45 times in play-ins. We've seen it 45 times in group stage. You give him his best champion, he is going to beat you. He just simply is not able to be caught. I tweeted this out today. For all the people who continue to try and catch in quotations, Akali in side lanes when other members of the team have teleport up. What the hell are you even trying to do? She's going to survive long enough for everybody else on the team to get there and you're gonna get blasted in the team fight. I just don't understand why it is so consistent with pro teams at Worlds this year that, oh, there's an Akali by herself in the side lane and we don't have vision of, everybody, of anybody else. Let's go get her. And they try for like 30 seconds to kill her. She dodges everything, uses ultimate to get out, and then stopwatches, and then the entire team is there, and you all die, and then she gets a triple kill. I just don't understand it. Zika's awesome. He's way too good, honestly, for this team. I'm not going to say that King and Pio should Deft and Barrel are bad, but he is legit like a top 10 player in the world right now, and uh, it's really, really, really fun to watch. He's making DRX look like prime time uh, television here for League of Legends, and that's awesome. He gets another player of the game under his belt here. I think that's like his seventh. For me, at Worlds so far this year, unbelievable. He has genuinely been probably the biggest, like, standout player of Worlds so far, and it's really awesome to see as someone who's been on the hype train for him for two plus years now, I would say. Last year was when I really, really came around to really liking him, but this year is when I became like, oh, he's actually like a top 20 player in the world. I was saying that all throughout the LCK split. I put him on my second team All-Pro in the LCK. I got a ton of disagreements about that, and you know what? Here he is now looking like one of the biggest stars on the world stage. I'm really, really glad to see people finally taking note of how good he is, and uh, I really hope he's able to keep it up. He's been genuinely fantastic, but the Heimer support pick, kind of transitioning there, uh, comes out here. I actually think it pairs really well with the Ash. You have a ton of CC and lockdown here to really set up for the Aatrox and the Akali to be able to take over the rest of the game. You have a ton of disabling in team fights, whether it's Ash Arrow, whether it's Heimer, you know, if he wants to uh, ultimate his E, that's pretty awesome. Or even just like Vi ultimate onto the back line. Like you have a ton of ways to deal with the Azir or the Callisto or whatever ends up being a huge problem for you. And so really, really like the, the idea around what DRX went for. And I think they executed on it well. As for Rogue, already talked a bit about this comp. I think it's kind of trash. Um, some interesting pieces. I really like Azir Callista as a duo. I think Callista can really dominate a lot of early landing phases, and you can transition that into a late game where Azir can be kind of that big backline damage dealer, and Callista can be a little bit more aggressive in how she positions because you have that consistent damage source with the Azir. You bring the Jarvan in. He has good early game pressure, but he can get outscaled, especially in a matchup where he's not ahead. Uh, it's just the Rumble and the Nasus that I don't really get. Rumble as a counter to Aatrox is something I understand, like... Odo plays a really good Rumble. It's one of his signature picks, and you get, like, the hot pot combo here with Jarvan. You can really set up for a lot of these team fights, but you're not winning these team fights. Like, you're just not winning these front-to-back team fights in the way that you need to, especially if Callista's not going to be able to generate a lead in the bottom lane, which she's not because she has no support. And I know there's going to be people out there that are like, NASA's support can work in certain scenarios. I'm sure it can. I'm sure there are scenarios in which NASA's support works. You know what it wasn't? This game. Ashheimer? Are you kidding me? That's like the worst Nasus lane I could potentially think of. And Trimby looked like it. I don't know if he accomplished literally anything this game. The Wither is actually relatively difficult to deal with for a lot of attack speed oriented ADCs. Why would you do this into one of the most versatile utility oriented AD carries and then a ranged melee support that you can't, or not ranged melee, a ranged mage support that you cannot touch at any point during the laning phase? It just makes no sense. Everybody on the internet's beaten it to death. Trimby's done of the game. This isn't really a big shock, I think, to anybody watching this video. Trimby played bad. The Nasus pick made him look even worse. And so, pretty, pretty easy choice here. This was by far the worst game he's had at Worlds so far. He's actually been a huge positive for a rogue team that I think has really overperformed a lot of people's expectations. But I guess eventually you got to come crashing back down. And that's what happened to Rogue here. And it's what happened to Trimby because he just got blown away. Comp really had no chance here. The Callista really needs to be able to assert her dominance early because it's not like she scales super hard from behind. She's going to be relatively neutral and, like I said, had no chance. She was 1v2 all laning phase. And then you've got Maorang and Odo just kind of running it down on the top side. They go for this, like, ult combo over and over and over again. 
a, a lot of these fights, they just have to know they don't win. Multiple around Rift Herald, where they re-engage only to die, and it's just like, I don't understand what you're thinking. It's just a lot of laps of judgment here when it comes to Rogue. Really want to see them go back to the well that kind of got them here, and that's tanks in the top lane, uh, a, a really early game bot lane that you can play around with an aggressive jungler. When Malring plays from behind, like I said, he's a completely different jungler from ahead. He's a completely different jungler from behind as well. When he's losing, he is awful. I talked about this in the LAC as well. He's one of the worst junglers in any major region. When he doesn't generate a lead, he just simply does not know how to take concessions on the map, and he kind of becomes invisible. Unfortunately for Rogue, he was not invisible this game because he was constantly dying to the Aatrox. And so certainly some adjustments to make for Rogue, but I think if they kind of get back to their core here, maybe don't try to go too far out of the comfort zone. Maybe ban Akali against Zika. I understand banning Silas, but why did you ban Victor over Akali? It just doesn't make any sense. Just maybe get a little bit of a better grip on draft. I think you should be a little bit more adjusted, but... Uh, unfortunately, Rogue cannot pay forward the favor that Gam was able to do them in the last game. Gam confirms Rogue in the quarterfinals, and Rogue losing here confirms that Gam is now eliminated from Worlds. There is no miracle day for Gam because uh, DRX has three wins and Gam can only get two. So, unfortunate for Rogue, but congrats to DRX. They're in a pretty good spot here. They're certainly not out of it by any means. Their big game against Top Esports is going to be later in the day. If they're not able to pick up a win there, then Top actually has a chance to be able to make this a little bit interesting. Assuming, of course, that DRX isn't able to take down the powerhouses that are GAM. There is still a scenario in which we get a tiebreaker for second getting out of that group, but uh, it's looking more and more likely that DRX might actually be one of the big favorites to come out of this group at number one, especially if they're going to play like this with some pretty crazy picks that they were able to pull off. Moving on to game number four now, and... This could actually seal the group in its tracks as with a win from the favored team, it would actually clear out the top two teams as the two teams making it out of groups because with Top Esports' loss earlier in the day, four became the magic number and DRX is only one win away from that. So we had a pretty interesting one between DRX and GAM Esports and unfortunately for Top Esports fans and GAM fans, DRX is able to pick up the win here and that confirms that the two teams getting out of group C with two games left to go already, are going to be Rogue and DRX. This officially eliminates Top Esports from Worlds 2022. An insane sentence to say, but we'll get to that more when we talk about them, because they're in both of the final two games. So let's talk about this one first and foremost. DRX still continuing to look great, and in fact, this is a very similar comp to what they played in the last game here against Rogue. They pull out the Ashheimer in the bot lane again. If it worked once, it's gonna work twice. That must be their thought. And you know what? Aatrox was left up again. So their weak side top becomes a strong side top because now they have an Aatrox. And so you really gotta feel kind of interesting for these drafts. It is really difficult, I will say, on red side. There are so many priority threats in the meta right now. Things like the Caitlyn, things like the Azir, things like the Maokai to really feel comfortable. Even the Yumi, right? Like, or Sejuani, or whatever, right? There's so many things, plus Aatrox, to include that are, like, must-bans, that are things that you really can't be giving over to the enemy team. Unfortunately, almost always one is going to slip through the cracks, and for this game, it was the Aatrox, just like it was last game. I think that does wonders for this DRX team in general, because Kingen, generally speaking, is a little bit of the weak point of this team. While I actually think he probably had the best split of his LCK career this year in summer, he's always been a little bit of a weak link for some good teams. He was a weak link in the LPL for BLG, and he was a weak link for DRX last year when this team was really trying to make a push. And remember, that DRX team wasn't really all that talented, especially as we learned in hindsight with a bunch of their players leaving the next year. And so, a lot of interesting things here to give him the Aatrox in the top lane. Caitlyn, a pick that I think is relatively weak compared to how it's viewed. I think it's a good pick, but certainly not an S-tier pick. I think it becomes an S-tier pick in the hands of Deft, who has always been one of the best Caitlyns in the world. Azir, probably something I would have replaced with the Aatrox. Well, Azir is incredibly strong... It kind of takes Zika off comfort because he really wants to play those melee mids. And while he's certainly not bad at Azir, like we've seen that multiple times throughout this tournament already, honestly, I'd rather have him on Azir than Silas or Akali. And so uh, I, I don't I don't hate the idea of dropping Azir for Aatrox, but if you're going to leave Aatrox open, you got to have some sort of counter to it. Gam goes with a really wild draft. This is the second game in a row where we don't have a single regular support in the game. 
You draft the Syndra on R3. We all think that's going to go mid lane because Kati has played a ton of that in the VCS this year. It was actually his most played mid laner this year. And so we feel pretty confident that that Syndra pick is going to be going into the mid lane, that they're going to be playing it. But no, they flex the Syndra to the bot lane for BA and they draft the Anivia to actually play into the Silas. I actually really like this decision. Syndra is a really interesting counter pick to the Heimer in the bot lane because she can just throw the turrets, but also... She does really, really well into these matchups that she can try and be oppressive into. And as long as Ash and Heimer don't dominate super hard early, it is playable. Uh, but they go for the Fiora in the top lane on R1. Now, this is where everything starts to fall apart. As we know, Gam is owned by a North American team in Energy. And uh, you can't be picking Fiora if you're owned by an NA org. You just can't be doing it. This kind of applies to Rogue as well, since they're also, I think, an NA organization that just owns a spot in the LEC. But... You can't be picking Fiora top lane. You just can't be doing it as an org owned by an NA team. And you know what? It played out exactly as we expected. There were multiple plays in the early game. Not only was Pioshik really active, I would say, in the early game, generally speaking, but Deft and Barrel were able to generate a pretty sizable lead in the bot lane because Deft is simply just better. Like, he's too good. It, I feel really bad for Style and BA because they were really good in the BCS. And I really liked how they played in the playoffs, but... It's just a completely different level in this group. Comp, Deft, and Jackie Love are your three other 80 carries that you have to play into consistently. It's just a disaster to have to do that for Style and BA. And they unfortunately just do not look like they are ready to play on this level. They go for the Callista, and while I do think this is winnable, it didn't work. The Ash is really, really good into Callista, as we learned last game, because she can slow the attack speed, and Heimer does a really good job of being able to lock down the Callista. You're really hoping the Syndra is able to, you know, disrupt that just a tad bit, but it takes the Syndra way too long to get online, and she's never really all that tanky enough to really survive any of these engages anyways. If she gets hit by arrow, or if Callista gets hit by arrow post six, like, they're just dead. There's not really a lot of ways to disengage that situation. So Deft and Barrel get out to a pretty good spot in lane, and then we get the attempted three-man dive on the Aatrox in the top lane that Kingen eventually turns around. You gotta give a ton of credit to Deft with the full court, the full map, the global arrow that hits the Fiora while she's tanking under tower, kills her. The the Jarvan ends up dying in that engage as well, and then Kingen turns around and kills the Anivia, or maybe it was the Syndra. I don't remember. It was three people top. A phenomenal play, obviously, by Kingen, and you gotta give him the credit for it, but... Big shout out to Deft for that long range arrow that really set the play up to be a lot easier for DRX in the long run. Everything this game was really set up by Deft on this Ash. When he's on playmakers like this Ash, this is where I actually think Deft is at his best. He's a really solid laner. I talked about this in the LCK. He maybe gets a little bit overblown for his lane stats. While I don't think he's like the best laner in the world, he's not going to be able to dominate like Ruler or, or players like that like consistently in lane. What he is really good at is not losing. He is pretty much always even in lane no matter what. And he can win lane, especially against a, a bot lane like Sile and BA with that assistance. And he was really able to dominate that. But where he really shines is these late game team fights, being able to make plays for his team. He's really smart in the mid game and you give him tools to be able to be proactive on that champion. Really, really love that for him. So the Ash pick has really been working out. Deft is going to get my player of the game here. It's his first of worlds. I hope it's not his last. Um, because, you know, this is the miracle run for Deft. This might be his final go around at the World Championship, so it's really, really good to see him playing at such a high level. Barrel continues to play this Heimer really, really well. Really entertaining to see Heimer on the grand stage. I know a lot of people hate this champion, and I understand why, but seeing him at the pro level is always going to be entertaining. You got Zika on a mid lane, uh, melee mid laner that can really affect a lot of the outcomes on the map with Silas can stay in lane and farm or can move around and, and work with Viego and he kind of does a little bit of both. He doesn't have to be the focal point in this game and that's always going to be good because he's going to be consistent on these champions in the late game. Pioshik's great on the Viego and Kingen uh, really takes over on the Aatrox. He's unkillable by the end of this game. So really, really good game from DRX overall. For Gam, I like the ingenuity of the draft, especially for your final game at Worlds here. Unfortunately, it just wasn't able to work out. The Anivia interaction, really, really intriguing. Uh, Pioshik has probably the most interesting interaction of Worlds so far, where he kills Anivia and then becomes Anivia and then dies, but he gets the egg passive. I mean, it's really, really crazy. I didn't know Viego could turn into the egg if he was Anivia, but it's good to learn that on the world stage. It was really cool to see it. I don't think I've ever seen that interaction before at a pro level. So really, really cool to see that. The Anivia kind of working against them, but I do like everything outside of that in this draft. The Anivia does really well typically into melee mids like Silas. She should be able to shut them down and actually have a relative amount of pressure in a lot of these skirmishes in the jungle, mostly because Anivia's kit is basically built for skirmishes in the jungle. And then, like I said, I think in theory, the Syndra can work into Heimer Ash. Unfortunately, just execution-wise, it wasn't pulled off. 
The Jarvan, very feast or famine pick. Unfortunately, it was a little bit of famine. But Levy actually played really well at this tournament. I think if he was on a better team, he would be a jungler to, to be reckoned with. He is like NAEU caliber when it comes to jungling. And so it would be interesting to see him maybe get another shot at one of those levels. Obviously, formerly on 100 Thieves, but that whole roster situation was a disaster there. So a lot to talk about. But would it be interesting definitely to see him get another shot on that team? And then, unfortunately, you've got the Fiora in the top lane. And the Fiora was a disaster. That tower dive going wrong early in the game really set her back, like, a lot and made the game pretty much impossible. Not to mention the fact that Fiora just generally hasn't been all that strong at this tournament. I know a lot of people see it as a counterpick, but if you're not the better player, it is often not a counterpick. It's not worth leaving Aatrox up if you can't just, like, outskill them on the Fiora. So, Kiaya, unfortunately, getting done of the game, but... Uh, it, it's really hard. Like, playing this Fiora Aatrox matchup is really difficult, especially from behind, which is what happened after that dive, so. A lot of interesting plays overall. Gam certainly showed up on the major stage and kind of gave a lot of VCS fans, I think, exactly what they were looking for. This is a region that has been missing out on international play for years now because of the pandemic, so for them to get back and really perform admirably here while they weren't, you know, able to take a lot of games, they certainly looked fun in a lot of them. Some interesting drafts and a huge win over Top Esports that as we see now, really did affect the outcome of this group. Really can't say a lot of bad things about GAM. Probably the most fun game of the year. Really, really glad they were at this tournament. And then for DRX, with this win, you clinched yourself quarterfinals. That's got to feel really good for a team that ended the LCK regular season at 500 in terms of win percentage. So, I incredible. For their turnaround, they were so inconsistent throughout the year. They've really capitalized on the best versions of themselves and brought that out at Worlds. Zika, Deft, Pioshik, King and even Barrel, like they've all looked the best that they've looked all year long at this tournament. I think a lot of DRX fans around the world are just really, really hoping that this isn't some sort of mirage and that they can keep it up throughout the rest of uh, pretty much all of the play. Hopefully down to a semifinals, maybe even a finals berth. A miraculous run for Deft would be a fantastic end. Moving on to game number five now. And game number five, while the group is already intact, both games five and six do have a little bit of potential to shake up how the rest of the day progresses. Top Esports is going to be playing against the two top teams getting out of the group already in the final two games, and they hold the power of spoiler in their hands. If they're able to beat one of the teams and not the other, that team will then get first in the group. If they're able to beat neither or both, then those two teams will have to play a tiebreaker to see who comes out of the group at number one. So game number five, very important, but only with the context of both games in mind. So let's go ahead and see how the first one panned out. Of course, we've got Top Esports in it, but in the first one, they're going to be going up against Rogue, and Top Esports is able to pick up a very crucial win here, and it was dominant. This was a destruction, and I, I have to say that because I think there were a lot of EU fans online that are really trying to cope with this a tad bit, and I understand you got one team out. We got zero teams out, so I have no room to talk, but you guys got one team out, and, uh, it's, it's good, they're out of the group, but this was not good. This was a really, really lackluster looking performance from a team that honestly, in my opinion, looks to have been solved in draft. Top Esports bans the Lucian, they ban the Maokai, and they ban the Orn. Okay, well, now all the things that Rogue really likes to play are off the board. Now the Azir's left up, and it actually goes all the way through pick and ban. That's not taken. The Caitlyn's left up, and they're able to get it on red side, which is insane, but... To do that, Rogue has to leave up Aatrox, so now they have to play into the Aatrox. Never something that I would consider good. Odo, a relatively good weak side top lane player, Aatrox is a little bit of a different story, though. Even though they are able to trade off the Caitlyn, and they actually are able to get the Silas here as well, which I think is overall a really good trade for most teams. Unfortunately, Top Esports has a really good answer to the Caitlyn, the best answer in the game, and that is Draven. Draven, really, really solid into Caitlyn, but only if you're good at Draven. I can't stress that enough. This is not a pick-up-and-play kind of lane matchup. You are going to get abused if you are not very, very good at the champion. Luckily, Jackie Love, a little bit known for that Draven pick that he has, so he's feeling very confident to pull that out. They go B5 Blitzcrank here as well for Mark. He's never played a single game of Blitzcrank competitively, but you know what? I believe it in Blitzcrank's a really interesting champion, especially for two relatively frail uh, bot laners here in Caitlyn and Lux. Really easy targets if you do land that hook to be able to punish, especially with the ridiculous amount of damage that Draven is able to do very quickly early in the game. And so 
kind of the makings of an explosive bot lane here, and boy did that pay off, because boy did Jackie Love and Mark completely steamroll this entire game. Player of the game is going to go to Jackie Love for me, but you could just as easily give this to Mark on the Blitzcrank. I think both of them deserve it basically equally. Mark was hitting hook after hook after hook in the early game. Caitlyn was dying, Lux was dying, Vi was dying. It didn't matter. If he landed a hook, someone was dying. And we hit this point by 10, 15 minutes where Jackie Love legit has like 3k gold more than anyone in the game. And it's it's over. It's There's no stopping that Draven from this point. I talk about Draven as a pick I really like. I've talked about him a ton over the course of the year. I talk about him a lot less now at Worlds because I don't think it's really a, a meta that's super conducive to Draven. Can be a big feast or famine pick. Obviously, when Draven gets rolling, he is legit unbeatable. He's the best champion in the game if he has that kind of a gold lead. But he's also one of the worst champions in the game if he never actually hits his cash out, which we saw earlier in the tournament against a Caitlyn as a response. If you never actually get that cash out, the Draven is useless. So it can be a little bit feast or famine, but this is the feast. This is what it looks like to completely feast as a Draven player. They dominated this game. Jackie Love was doing a billion damage by the end game, and there was really no one on the enemy team that was even going to have a chance of being able to stop them. Big credit to Jackie Love. Big credit to Mark. I want to give a shout out to Mark because I think a lot of people are overlooking him, but I think you can make a real case that he has just simply been the best player on top esports at Worlds this year. I think even in their losses, he's looked relatively good, and he definitely has looked good in their wins as well over Gam the first time, and then now Rogue in this game here. I think he's been a huge proponent for why top esports has been so good, and I thought he was a little bit underrated going into the tournament just in general. So to see him popping off and really looking good, I think is great. And you know who's got to feel really good about this bot lane winning so hard? Knight. And I know I I'm going to sound like a homer here. I'm going to sound like someone who doesn't love to change their opinions, but any long-term fan of this channel will know I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. I've been wrong about a lot of things. That's just the nature of the game that I'm in. I, I make a lot of predictions. I have a lot of analysis. And sometimes players change and they grow and they adapt or they, you know, change in the wrong way and they start to fail and don't live up to the expectations. I'm not afraid of being wrong. I just don't think I'm wrong here. Knight has been really freaking good at this tournament and it just doesn't matter. I know a lot of people are going to say, oh yeah, so he's got the best laning stats of anybody at the tournament. What is he actually doing to help his team win? And my counter to that is, Yes, he has the best laning stats of the tournament, but by the time laning phase is over and he tries to move out at 10 minutes, which I don't think is that unreasonable, top esports, both of the other lanes are at such a huge disadvantage. Jackie Love and Mark losing the early game consistently. Wayward has been dissected in most matchups in the top lane, and Tian certainly not generating jungle leads throughout this tournament. What is Knight supposed to do by himself? I really feel bad for him. He's had a really good tournament, and yet I think the idea and the storyline of Knight choking in international tournaments is going to persist here. I do not think that his performance has lived up to that reputation at this tournament so far, and yet I think it will be unjustly given to him, and hopefully he can find a way to overcome that demon. But another really good game for Macaulay, uh, uh, for Knight on Akali in this one, really was accentuating the damage from Draven really well. Nobody was safe in this game. Tian probably had his most comprehensive performance of the tournament so far, was really just able to outjungle Maorang, and like I said, once you start out jungling Maorang, Maorang really has no tools to be able to come back in the game. Even Wayward on the Aatrox, while he was certainly not good in this game, he was getting caught out way too much. Five deaths on Aatrox? Come on, man. Like, Aatrox is literally unkillable. How do you have five deaths on Aatrox? So, not the best game overall, but he didn't need to be. He was completely carried by his bot lane, and you know what? That's fine. I'd be happy to be carried by my bot lane at Worlds and still win a game, and so... We'll take what we can get. As for Rogue, uh, it's frustrating. I think they start to have an idea of a comp here. Caitlyn Lux is something that I would think that this team would actually excel playing on. It's something that Comp and Trimby have both been very, very active on over the course of their times as pros. And so I would expect them to be able to play it at an international level. Unfortunately, I really do think Caitlyn Lux relies a lot more on jungle attention than people give it credit for. Yes, Caitlyn and Lux are incredibly oppressive to play into, but... If they start losing and the jungler is not there to really like bail them out of some tough situations, they're exploitable. If enemy jungler comes in, Lee Sin especially, and he gets on top of one of the two, especially with a Blitzcrank, with a Draven, you have so much kill pressure over that lane. They have to win early or else they are useless. I've talked about this on the channel before. I don't think Caitlyn Lux is an S-tier combination that needs to be banned by every team in the game. I think it is very situational. I don't think Caitlyn Lux is bad. I think it's incredibly strong in lane and it does have limited counters, but... If it doesn't win, like, you lose the game. You have no damage coming out from that point. She scales poorly, to say the very least. And so, 
You really have to be able to win. Unfortunately for Comp and Trimby, they're not able to do that. Trimby got hit with so many Blitzcrank hooks this game. He's going to get my dead of the game on the Lux. Not a good performance from him. Not a good performance from Comp, who just also just got completely outplayed in this game by Jackie Love and Mark. And like I said, Odo and Malrang just kind of lost. While top lane was super boring, both of them looked pretty garbage in team fights. And then Malrang just got out jungled. Like I said, when Malrang loses, he loses hard. Larson was fine. He didn't really do anything this game. Had some really good stolen ults, but at the end of the day, they were so far behind, they were never going to be able to come back and win this game. What does this mean for both of these teams? Well, this is huge for DRX, surprisingly enough. It means that now moving into game number six, if they were able to take a win over top esports like they did earlier in the group stage, they actually confirmed themselves for number one in this group with no tiebreaker. Rogue is now hoping that the team that just beat them in this game can pick up another victory to at least get one more shot, but... We're now looking at a disastrous week for Europe. Yes, Rogue was able to pick up the win over Gam at the beginning of the day, but that's the only win for Europe in week two. Um, an 0-3 from Fnatic, an 0-3 from G2, a 1-2 from Rogue, even though they're getting out of the group. It's certainly not filling you with a ton of confidence. It feels like they had a really good read on the meta and just weren't able to adapt when other teams kind of saw the playstyle that they wanted to go for. But they might have another chance later in the day if Top Esports can get it done. So... A lot of the Game 5, you know, results and, and the outcomes of what happened here are really going to depend on what happens now in the next game, Game number 6. But that is going to bring us to our penultimate Game number 6. The last game for Top Esports, but maybe not the last game of the day, as depending on if they can grab a win here over DRX, we might be getting a tiebreaker to end out the day. And what a situation that would create, where Top Esports back-to-back -back is able to beat the two teams getting out of the group and doesn't even have a chance to play for their way out as they've already been eliminated. It would certainly be something, but let's go ahead and see if that fate comes true for TES as we have a matchup between Top Esports and DRX for control of the group. And the winner was Top Esports. They are able to do it. They're able to pick up the win here and really, really make this group interesting it's going to force a tiebreaker now, a game number seven to be played between Rogue and DRX, two teams that couldn't quite get it done against TES in this second week. But man, this has to feel heartbreaking for top esports fans because they did it. Like they beat both teams that were getting out of this group. They ended their tournament on a massive high note. And that loss against GAM earlier in the day comes back to completely bite them. They were one or two autos away from being able to win that game. And now looking back on it now, if they win that game, you're a three, you're in a three-way tie for first place. And with current form, I think you can make a really solid argument that they have a pretty good shot not only to get out of the group, but maybe to finish in first in the group. I mean, it is actually insane that this team is out, but let's talk about how they played in this one. Ton of credit over to pretty much everybody. Again, this was a really solid, pretty typical win from them. Like this was what they looked like. In the regular season, I'll say for most of the year, where not a ton of like super flashy plays like Jackie Love and Mark on the Lucian and Nami are able to win super hard early into a draft that I quite frankly hate on the side of DRX. Not because of the draft itself. I actually like the components of this draft a lot. I think the final component is a disaster and I think it actually just takes away all of the advantages you were able to create with the other picks. But Lucian Nami has a really good lane matchup into Misfortune just in general. You have the misfortune on R5. I get it. Def's really good at the champion, but complete disaster. No CC. You're not even playing it with an engager. So you have no lockdown for the ultimate. You have no CC on the rest of the team. It's Graves Azir. They're the carries. And so the MFM ends up just becoming this kind of third damage dealer on the team that doesn't even really do all that much damage because you have no lockdown for her ultimate. Really a bad situation overall for DRX. That pick almost single-handedly ruins this entire team comp, in my opinion, but even outside of that, Top Esports has a lot of advantages that they can take advantage of in the early game. The Lucianami always going to be strong, and you can always play towards that lane. Tion was very active in playing towards that lane in this game. Tion had a great game. Talk about controlling the map. I want to give a big shout out to Tion. This is what the MVP of the LPL should look like, right? The, I, I've talked at length about how I don't think he was the MVP this year. I think his teammate was, but... Like, this is an MVP-level performance. It doesn't really show it on, like, the stat sheet, 4, 1, and 7. Pretty good score, but doesn't really take over in your mind. This was dominant when you watch the game. I mean, he held every inch of this map for his own. By 15 minutes into the game, DRX couldn't walk into their own jungle without them dying to Tian or Knight or Jackie Love or somebody because there was always vision and there was always pressure. And that's what a really good, like, world-class jungler is able to do in these games. Tian's going to get player of the game. If he was able to play like this 
in every single game that they played, uh, Top Esports would have gone 6-0. It really is no question. He was, in my opinion, the difference between this team getting out and this team not getting out. I know a lot of people are going to shit on Wayward, and Wayward was their worst player at this tournament. I will definitely say that. But they could have won with Wayward playing bad. They won last game against Rogue with Wayward playing bad. If Tian was stepping up and really out-jungling Pioshik and out-jungling Maorang, they would have been out of this group. And for them to get this performance in game number six, while it's great to see that it's possible, top esports fans got to feel a little bit like dumbfounded that they weren't able to get this earlier from him. He was great in the final two games. Where was this in week one? And where was this against Gam when Levi ran shop against you on a Karthus pick? So... I don't know. I, I feel like I'm complaining too much about Tion. I don't want to get into this argument too much. I, I've got a lot of people in the comment section that love him, and I understand it. He's a really fun player, and he's got a great story. He came back from wrist injuries, and you really hope that he can continue to play at a super high level. The, the storyline of his MVP is great. I just really don't think he played all that well at Worlds, and this game was great for him. It just feels more like a missed opportunity than a celebration in this one. So, Tion player of the game, Jackie Love and Mark continue to dominate bot lanes that just simply aren't ready for them. I love Deft and I love Barrel, but man, Misfortune was not the pick here, and Lucian Nami completely takes over. Knight on the Silas gets to play, like, third fiddle in this comp. Man, that's gotta feel pretty good for Knight. And then Wayward just gets to play a tank in the top lane. Pretty good deal of business for top esports overall. But for DRX, disastrous loss here. You're actually in a decent position. I would say for a majority of the early game here, you're really not nearly as down as you should be. In fact, I think you're up in gold until like 10 or 15 minutes into the game, which is a pretty great position to be in when you've got Maokai, Graves, Azir. I mean, you've got a ridiculous amount of team fight pressure front to back towards the back half of the game. If you had any lockdown, the MF would be incredibly scary and you would be really looking at this comp as terrifying. I really do think that if this MF was Aphelios or Jinx or even Kaisa, I don't even like Kaisa. I'm like the anti-Kaisa guy. But even Kaisa, I think would have worked in this comp. If you had some sort of like, yeah, maybe not so great in the early game, can afford to be down 1020 CS. But once you get those items, really going to be taking over in the late game. Like, I think your mid game goes completely differently here. I'm not going to say it's a win, but I do think it becomes a lot easier for you to be able to make plays. I do think that the struggle of the top side was a big problem for them in this game. Kingen's going to get my dead of the game here. He's going to get them for most of DRX's losses. He, he kind of continues to be weak side for DRX. And yeah, weak side in both senses of the word of. He doesn't really get a lot of attention. And also he's the weaker side, right? Like, it's kind of every sense of weak side, right? You get put on the Maokai pick here, who is overpowered in the meta. There is no questions about that. I, I don't care that, like, top lane, he isn't as, like, exploitable, right? Or whatever, right? He's still incredibly dominant. And while I think Pioshik played Maokai incredibly well in play-ins, and I would have loved to see him run that back, Maokai with Graves in the jungle, a ton of damage, and Graves Azir as a duo, an incredibly difficult duo to deal with in the late game, that's going to be fine. Unfortunately, Pioshik gets run over, and I mean completely run over in this jungle matchup. Tian just outplays him from the beginning to the end. Graves never really gets online, as we've seen throughout the day. If Graves doesn't have, like, item advantages and gold leads, he really does fall off and doesn't become that late game carry that I think a lot of players want that Graves to be. You're really relying a ton on Zika on this Azir. I talked about this in an earlier game as well. Uh, Top Esports did a really good job. The Akali is gone and they pick away the Silas. Those are the two picks that you really have to take Zika off of. He's going to pick one of the two if he has them available, but put him on the Azir, even put him on something like the LeBlanc. That He's good on these picks, but he's not like a top 10 player in the world on these picks. I really like this ideology. You're relying a ton on the Azir to be able to win this game for them. And unfortunately, against a Viego, against a Lucian, it's just going to become a lot more difficult for that to happen. I think DRX had an avenue to win, but it certainly wasn't there, right? I think the Misfortune being swapped out for a more late game AD carry would have given you an even bigger avenue to win. Maybe flex the Maokai into the jungle and even go for something aggressive on the top side. I don't usually say things like that, but I think as a composition, that could work well here, especially with the Lulu. I think that gives you so many more options. But I do understand why, as a team, you would rather have a carry on Pioshik than a carry on Kingen. I just think maybe compositionally, that would have worked a tad bit better. So what does this now mean? Well, DRX losing here means we now jump into a Game 7 tiebreaker between DRX and Rogue. Both of them are confirmed out of the group, even with Top Esports winning this game. Both DRX and Rogue are confirmed out of the group. Top Esports sitting at 3-3, three and three, both DRX and Rogue sitting at 4-2. and two. So they're out, but they now have to play to see who is going to get the number one seed in this group. An incredibly important game for both of those teams, but before we jump into that, I just got to talk about Top Esports for a second. This, I, I don't want to go preachy here, but this is why I 
advocate so, so heavily for three teams out of groups. I know it seems like an easy solution, and maybe it's not even the best solution, but this idea that Top Esports is a team that doesn't deserve to play a best one best of five at Worlds at the very least is just absurd to me. Why do we punish teams so much for six best of ones? It just feels like a bad format in general. I know a lot of this is like taken out by NA fans a lot of the time. Like, oh, let NA play a best of uh, five at Worlds. Or even some EU fans sometimes like, oh, let EU play. I just want teams to play best of fives. I'm not an NA fan. I'm not an EU fan. I'm not a... Uh, an LCK, an LPL, a VCS, whatever. Like, I just want the best League of Legends, and I want to see it. I, I want these teams to get a chance on the big stage, and it just feels like a crime that the system is in place where DRX and Rogue now get to play a best of five, and Top Esports don't after they were able to beat both of them in week two. I understand that, like, the results should matter, and I agree. I think the format that I think a lot of people on Reddit and on Twitter have been preaching where three teams get out of groups your top two seeds are in uppers bracket and you introduce a losers bracket to worlds and the third place from every group automatically gets slotted in losers bracket i think that gives you an advantage for getting top two but it doesn't completely eliminate you from worlds for having one or two bad games top esports had one bad game today against gam they were one or two autos away and that's just not the storyline i want to define their season and i would love to see them get a shot they clearly prove they're good enough and I think the Archaic Worlds format just needs a revamp. If it's not what I propose, there are a ton of great suggestions out there. More groups so that more teams have a chance of being able to play in the knockout stage. Whatever it is, more best of fives, please. That's all I'm asking for. And Top Esports winning this game, beating Rogue and DRX today, I think is the best possible example I can give. They should not be out of the tournament for this. They are, though, and so it's definitely an unfortunate end to their season. I hope these players don't get mental boomed from this, but... Uh, it's got it's got to feel bad that you were able to dominate some of the you know two of the best teams in the world so far at this tournament, and uh, that means nothing for you. It's just got to feel pretty bad, and I can definitely I can definitely feel for them in this instance. With all that being said, that now brings us to our tiebreaker game here in Group C. We only get one, and it's to decide who's going to be the number one seed and who's going to be the number two seed coming out of this group. Obviously, very important to grab the number one seed, but maybe less so than, than many other years. There's a lot of really strong second seeds at this tournament. Overall, this is just a good chance to gain some momentum, in my opinion, at the very least, going into the knockout stage. So, Who's going to be able to take it? It's DRX versus Rogue for that number one seed spot. And the winner of the tiebreaker in game number seven was DRX. They are able to do it from play-ins to winning their group. They're able to do it. They're able to take down Rogue in very convincing fashion. I mean, this game was not even remotely close. And this only adds more fuel to the fire of Rogue just kind of being a dumpster fire moving into... Uh, knockout stage, not it, not what you wanted to see really at all if you were a Rogue fan. Certainly some things you could have looked for in this case, but for you to go 1-3 today in your four games definitely doesn't feel like a team that's going into the knockout stage with the most momentum possible. We'll talk about some things that might start going wrong for them and why I certainly don't have a ton of high hopes for them going into the knockout stage, but for DRX, really good win. They continue to just feed off of the fact that their players are so good. I really like this draft because it doesn't give a lot of room for Rogue to outplay them so long as DRX executes. You've got the Caitlyn Lux, and while I've been talking a little bit lower on the Caitlyn Lux, it's different when Deft is on Caitlyn. It's just a completely different story. He is simply put one of the best Caitlyn players in the world. Barrel is going to be fine playing Lux, if Deft knows how to pilot the Caitlyn in an incredibly strong fashion, which they do. However, Rogue does a really interesting thing, and they actually answer with Poke themselves. They go for the Ezreal Karma. Now, Ezreal, you're typically associating with, like, more passive lanes, but paired up with the Karma, we've seen this in Pro a lot in the past, is actually a very difficult to play into lane, can be really difficult to out-pressure them, because the amount of Poke that comes out from Ezreal Q, from Karma Mantra Q, it's actually ridiculous. It's very easy for them to win trades, and then just force you to back off so they can push waves into tower. They end up scaling really, really well in this case as well with Ezreal outscaling Caitlyn. Just generally speaking, he's going to be doing way more in team fights so long as he's relatively even. So I like the answer from Rogue, but the rest of the draft definitely going in DRX's favor. They actually kind of go to that draft I was talking about a bit in game number six, where it's more of a facilitator in the jungle with the Vi, and then a more aggressive topside with the Camille to answer the tank. No Orn this game. It's Nar on the side of Odawamne because you don't want to give over the Orn or the Maokai. They ban the Lucian again. Rogue very much feels figured out, in my opinion, and Odo does not look nearly as good on this Nar at all, and Kingen's able to take advantage of that 
on the Camille. This was probably his best game of the day, and it was on the most aggressive pick. Now, I'm not saying they should go to that regularly, but in situations where they feel like they have a matchup where they can be a little bit more punishing in that top side, King is certainly not the kind of player that is just going to wither away and die. He had good performances in the LCK this year. Maybe give him a little bit more confidence. And then, haven't even talked about him, but I gotta bring him up. Zika's just too freaking good. He's actually broken. He's just too freaking good at this level. You cannot give him Akali or Silas. You, If you leave those champions up in champion select, you are going to lose the game. Akali wasn't even banned this game. He goes for the Silas instead. I like that. Larson's much better on Silas than he is on Akali, so it's a little bit of a takeaway here on B3. Gives DRX a lot more options because I think Silas, just generally speaking, can be supportive, can be a secondary carry. Or you can funnel gold into him and he can be a little bit more primary, which he was this game, but just more options. Even if he's equally, I, I think he's probably better at Akali than he is on Silas, but the Silas, I think just generally, especially with the Caitlyn Lux, is just going to give you a ton of pressure in the mid game. And that's kind of what they were looking for here. I really like Silas and Vi as a combo. I'm much lower on Vi as a pick generally because she does one thing and that's it. And especially against the comp that doesn't really have like a true quote unquote, like backline hyper carry threat. I don't really think she's all that useful, but you can at least ult the Ezreal, like that's something here. His Arcane Shift can't dodge the point and click, so that's pretty good on the side of Pioshik. But outside of that, this was the Zika show. He's going to get player of the game again at, what is this, his 8th, his ninth, his 27th player of the game of this tournament. He might be the best player at Worlds. Like, he genuinely might be the best player at Worlds. You have to take him off of these picks. The problem with that is DRX has so many picks outside of that. The Aatrox you can't give to Kingen because all of a sudden that weak side becomes a strong side. Heimer Ash has been a huge problem for teams today. You don't want to give over Yumi on red side, and so, like, what what are your options here? You don't really have a lot of uh, opportunities to take away both Akali and Silas and also take away the things that matter. You already left up the Caitlyn. You're sacrificing way too much to take those away at this point. Really, really smart drafting by DRX, and honestly, their team is just simply too versatile at this point to really take their stars off of what they need to be on. Now, if it were me... I'm getting Akali and Silas out of there. I'm ideally getting blue side on DRX against DRX as much as possible. I'm banning the Akali. I'm taking the Silas first pick. And I'm forcing him to play the Azir into me. He definitely feels like he's on a lower prio when on something like that Azir or even the LeBlanc. But, you know, there are other options in my opinion. Like, I don't, I don't think you have to ban, say, like... Heimerdinger like they can pull it out but there are ways to beat Heimer they just really didn't pull any of them out today maybe they don't feel like they have any of those comfortable picks ready to go even something like Ezreal Karma I think was playable in the Ash Heimer though so definitely some options just generally speaking it feels like DRX has such a mental advantage on every team in draft and Zika in particular as long as he gets one of his best picks he's going to pop off and he's going to carry DRX to wins he's becoming a superstar a global superstar right in front of our eyes. Defton Barrel were great. Caitlyn Lux is great for them. It lets them pressure lane in the early phase while not being completely irrelevant towards the back half because they're going to win lane. They're one of the few lanes that I really, really do trust them to be able to consistently win lane, even without jungle attention. Now, they did get it in this game from Pioshik, but it wasn't like a dominant amount of jungle attention. And so, really do like how DRX was able to play this game just in general. I like the draft and I like the execution of the draft. For Rogue, no comfort. We went at, from the beginning of the day with all comfort. We had the Jarvan already. We had the uh, Larson on Azir. We had Comp and Chimbi on Lucian Nami. And now we're at zero comfort. There is literally no comfort left on Rogue. They're forced to play this more poke-oriented bot lane, which I think can work, but they're just simply not as good as Defton Barrel, so they can't quite pull it off here. Maorang gets another whooping in the jungle. Pioshik, who's had trouble today already, he just got out jungle by Tian in the previous game, comes back a little bit more of a stable pick in the Vi. Maorang picks up the Lee Sin because he doesn't have the Jarvan available. He tries to make these early plays. I really like this idea of maybe trying to shut down the Caitlyn Lux early, but you know what? None of it works. Those uh, bindings are just simply too difficult to get through for the Lee Sin, and he's going to get outscaled indefinitely. And then when you take Odo off of his main tanks, they ban the Orn, they ban the Maokai. You found the solution to making Odo just a regular guy here at Worlds. I love Odo to death, and he's a great weak side player. But at a world-class level, Orn and Maokai are the two things he plays. You put him on the Gnar, you put him on something that has to potentially even be aggressive, he's going to be knocked down a peg. And we've seen that repeatedly over the course of this tournament. I think Rogue, unfortunately, has just simply been figured out at this point. You're really hoping that... The time now in between group stage and the knockout stage can let them practice and maybe come up with some new strategies that can take advantage of their strengths in the bot lane in the early game. Maorang's early dominance and pressure that he's able to generate with a lead. Odo on weak side, Larson as a really good late game team fighter. You should be able to theorycraft some sort of comp that is able to make Rogue work, but 
it is going to take some planning because currently I just don't have any confidence that they have that available to them right now. It's going to take some effort from this team. So we'll see if they do it. Mowering said of the game. I, I'm not sure if I said that. It could have been Mowering. It could have been Odo. Those were the two that I really considered. They played very similar games. Mowering just got completely outjungled. And honestly, he had a worse day. So for me, it felt more appropriate to give it to Mowering just in general. But that's actually going to close off Group C. DRX with this win has solidified the number one seed. Pretty advantageous. It means they get to skip out on the other number one seeds, most notably JD Gaming. But even T1 looks incredibly dangerous right now. So it does put them in a much more advantageous position. Obviously, the results of Group D are going to influence that a bit, in my opinion. If a team like Gen G gets the number two seed, all of a sudden that becomes a terrifying matchup to have to go into. But still, number one seed generally is going to be better because you get to dodge the teams with the most momentum. But for Rogue, you're now faced with a pretty much impossible challenge. Are you going to beat T1? I don't know. Are you going to beat JD Gaming? I don't know. Are you going to be able to beat either RNG or Gen.G? I really don't know. So uh, definitely some improvement needed for Rogue, but this is a team that has never really been able to be counted out. As soon as we start doubting them, that's when they emerge the best. So I think we're all hoping for that to happen as we move into the knockout stage. All right, well, that is going to do it for my Day 7 Worlds 2022 group stage overview and analysis. Group C is done and dusted. It's in the books. I want to thank you all for being super patient with me. Obviously, these videos all going out on time the day after, but as you can notice, my throat is absolutely killed. Uh, recording hours and hours and hours of, of recording audio every single day. Uh, you guys are patient with me. You're making sure that these videos still do super well, and I'm very appreciative of that. If you guys had any thoughts on these games, of course, leave them down in the comments section below. How do you think DRX and Rogue are going to perform in the knockout stage? Do you actually have lower expectations like I do? Or could you potentially see DRX or Rogue surprising people and potentially making it to the semifinals depending on the draw? Let me know down in the comment section below how you feel about that. And of course, while you're down there, hit the like button. As you can hear, I'm putting my all into these uh, videos and these recordings. And so if you're enjoying the content that I put out, I would really appreciate it. If you left a like and let me know uh, that you're enjoying the content, it really does mean a lot. Of course, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button. I put out content like this after every single day of Worlds. Off-season's coming up as well. I'm really excited for some off-season content that we're going to be rolling out. I really just love League of Legends. And if you love it as well, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell. Videos are going to be coming on this channel. Um, but of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.